So it's a pleasure to present you, Fernando Brandão. This is the first class of the school. And uh, Fernando is working for Microsoft and uh, University College London. And he will be soon joining Caltech. And uh, so that's it. Enjoy. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you. So, um, OK. I'm, I'm very loud, no? OK. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was here six years ago, and I always want to come back. Never had the chance, so I'm very happy to be here. I hope it's not more six years before I come back again. There's some echo. It's, it's, um, maybe it's better. Uh, so uh, the lectures will be a, about the topic that that I like a lot, which is try to use uh, quantum information theory. Uh, to understand better thermodynamics and, and statistical mechanics. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a very clear plan, so please ask as many questions as you want. Uh, so I'm originally from here, actually, from Belo Horizonte. So if you know Portuguese, you can ask in Portuguese. If you don't know, you can ask in any language you want. I, I might not understand, but you can ask anyway. So <laughs> uh, but please, just stop me as many times as you want. So the... Um, the motivation of, uh, I, I will give the lecture mostly on, on the whiteboard, but just some introduction, I'll, I'll give PowerPoints. Uh, so to, the idea is that we have, of course, the reason we are here is because we always study quantum information theory. And the motivation for this theory is that we want to you know, lay down the theory for future quantum-based technology, right? So we have all these great ideas. We have quantum computers, we have quantum cryptography, so on. And we'd like to understand what we'll be able to do one day right, with these new devices. And I'm a theorist, so uh, you know, I, I studied the, the theoretical part of this, of, of, you know, of this field. And there are many, uh, you, know, you can split it in many different ways, but there are, I guess, main five areas that people study in quantum information. So one, is quantum communication, and you can include quantum cryptography there. And the, the basic question is, you want to understand here, is what are the ultimate limits to information transmission, right? So we live in this quantum universe, uh, and we'd like to understand what's the best we can do if you want to you know, send information or if you want to do cryptography and so on. Uh, then very closely related to quantum communication is this area of entanglement theory, right? So in quantum information, we see entanglement not as something bizarre about quantum mechanics, but this new resource that we can use to make interesting things. And we like to understand how much of a resource entanglement is, right? And develop a quantitative theory of entanglement. Another very important area of, of the field is quantum error correction and, and fault tolerance. And this is really the reason why right, the field still exists, is that uh, this idea of quantum computation is not something like analog computation that is maybe a theoretical idea, but it will never be implemented, but it's much more like digital computation, right? In the sense that we can protect the quantum information from errors, and we can create a fault-tolerant quantum computer if we have you know, good enough control experimentally. So there's also very a lot of activities in this area. Uh, then there is quantum computation. Here we want to just you know, find uh, new algorithms, quantum algorithms, and them are much better than, than classical algorithms. And also quantum complexity theory. Here we want to understand what are the limitations of quantum computation, right? So, so which problems we cannot solve even with a quantum computer, or or how you know all these complexity classes they change if you put quantum information and so on. So this is like the field as it is, and there is a you know, this, we have been doing research on this for the past 20 years, more 25 years, and there is still a lot of of it going on. But a nice uh, a nice perhaps more recent direction of the field is that uh, we start talking with other areas of physics, right? So we have all this theory that we developed and now it would be good to see how we can apply it to other branches of physics or if there is relations between them. And this is like this quantum information connections that uh, you know, they are, they're growing a lot recently. There's a, a lot of nice work in this direction. Uh, so for example, in condensed matter physics, right, people like, you know, understanding entanglement better and understanding uh, quantum complexity better, we can 
we can have a, a new understanding of strongly correlated systems, right? It can develop new tools like, I don't know, uh, tensor networks or um, you know, understand limitations on, on the kind of system we might be able to understand and so on. This very, very interesting topic. Topological order, like this very important concept in condensed matter physics is tightly connected to quantum error correction and fault tolerance. There is a lot of work there too. Spin glass, we can connect to quantum complexity and so on. So this is like condensed matter. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the, maybe the biggest impact of quantum information is in experimental physics, right? There's all these the systems that people didn't study before or they studied very little that they really became mainstream because of quantum information and one day trying to, to get a quantum computer or quantum cryptography. And so there's like ion traps, linear optics, and we learn about linear optics in this school uh, and so on and, uh, and, and a lot of others. So another example in, in high energy physics, general relativity, also there is, is uh, like in the past five years, there is a lot of connections. Uh, people, you know, of course, topological quantum field theory, you can relate it to quantum complexity and quantum computation in a very nice way. So like the Jones polynomial makes the connection. Black hole physics is really, right, it's like, it's really a problem about quantum information, right? We want to understand how quantum mechanics can fit together with general relativity holography with entanglement theory and so on. So uh, it's really nice because, you know, in quantum information started a long time ago and then as any new area, there's a few people who are interested and most people just ignore it completely, right? So, so now I feel that, uh, you know, people from these other areas are starting to, to be interested in what we do and trying to talk to us and it's something exciting. Now I, I won't talk about any of these areas. What, what I want to focus is in another connection uh, that I've been thinking a lot uh, recently, which is between quantum information theory and, and thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Um, so uh, we've seen these lectures, you know, how to, for example, uh, how we can understand better thermodynamics on the, on the nanoscale, on a very small scale, or with quantum effects using uh, quantum information theory, or how we can understand better how quantum systems equilibrate using ideas from entanglement theory and quantum complexity theory and, and so on. So this is the area that we are going to focus, right? So this intersection of these two fields. Um, of course, it, you know, there is a lot of research on, on, on this topic nowadays, uh, a lot of interesting research. These lectures will be like some very tiny part of it, okay? So it won't be representative of the research being done. It will be just basically things that, that I like and that I have been thinking about. So. You know, hopefully, but hopefully the, the lectures will, will open your eyes and then you go there and read the other stuff that people do and, and learn more about it. So what do I want to do in the course? So it'll be like three lectures, there'll be some topics. Maybe I won't cover all of them, but this is what I, you know, uh, that we might, what we might see. Um, so the goal is to give examples of these connections of quantum information and, and the rest of physics uh, in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So today we will start with uh, thermodynamics, trying to understand thermodynamics, uh, and, the, and the, from a new point of view, and from a point of view what we call like a resource theory, which is some some theories in quantum mechanics that uh, you know that like entanglement theory is, is the best example when we we try to generalize what we did in entanglement theory to other other theories. So this I introduced like some some paradigm to to describe thermodynamics. It's called uh, thermal operations. Then I'll discuss uh, asymptotic state transformations. Uh, and then I'll discuss single, sh single copy state transformations. And we see how there is a, no a lot of analogies of, for example, entanglement theory and, and thermodynamics once we write in this, in this language. Then tomorrow, I, I wanna switch gears and uh, I, I wanna consider statistical mechanics or foundations of statistical mechanics, but from the point of view of, of quantum information theory and there's a lot of results, so I'll focus on, on two. One is how we can justify better the microcanonical ensemble that we all learned, and I will remind you tomorrow what it is, from using some tool which is uh, very used in quantum information and it is very interesting, which we call measure concentration. Then I wanna give another example of quantum information, how, how we can use quantum information to, to understand better when we can use when, when the, this thermodynamical ensembles, for example, microcanonical and canonical, they are equivalent when we can use them interchangeably and when we cannot, we can, we can study this problem using quantum information. 
then if I have time, uh, I at least I will mention some other aspect of this connection of thermodynamics and, and quantum information, maybe in the opposite direction, how some very basic ideas and tools from thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, they are useful for understanding a problem that we care about in quantum information. And this problem is to start, try to, is to understand correlations and entanglements in, in equilibrium systems. So uh, I'll consider two examples. One is to prove uh, area loss for entanglement for thermal states and how it has a very simple and, and elegant solution once we use the right ideas from statistical mechanics. Uh, and second, how you know, using some other ideas from statistical mechanics, specific heat in particular, we can prove area loss for like other states for arbitrary states. And finally, in the last lecture, probably, if I hope we get there, I want to introduce one, one of like the, the main ideas of, of quantum information theory or quantum channel theory, which is called uh, quantum decoupling. It's like an extremely useful tool, it's used everywhere. But if you see in, in the right way, it's also, you know, it's just a statement uh, from statistical mechanics, if you want. Uh, and I want to show how this quantum decoupling, this, this technique, it relates to to the problem of equilibration in statistical mechanics. And going back to something that we just mentioned in this lecture, how we can get a better understanding of the Landauer's principle, like one of, you know, of the cornerstones of this relation of information and thermodynamics using decoupling. So, so that's the plan. This is what we'll, we'll see. Okay, so my last slide. Of course, uh, so the whole point of these lectures will be, will, will be to argue that you know, everything that we did in quantum information is actually useful for statistical mechanics and, and thermodynamics. That's great. But of course, the, the relation between this, these two subjects go a long way back. And it's been uh, more of we getting a lot of tools from statistical mechanics that were developed, right, from statistical mechanics and applying to our fields. So, and, and why we do that? Well, because we share a very important concept with statistical mechanics, which is entropy, right, or quantum entropy. So for the fathers of statistical mechanics, this entropy was like the log of the number of accessible states. For us, it's the number of qubits, right, or bits of information, but it turns out it's the same, same idea. And so, you know, a lot of tools from statistical mechanics or quantum statistical mechanics, uh, like strong subadditivity of entropy or monotonicity relative entropy, and we'll see what they are later on in the course, or like more technical things like quantum Stein's lemma, they all were developed before we had quantum information theory, because people, this, these researchers were interested in statistical mechanics, and we all use them right a lot nowadays, right? So strong subjectivity is used everywhere, like to define conditional mutual information in protocols like state redistribution. Monotonicity is used, or relative entropy is used in any converse that you prove in quantum coding, right? Quantum Stein's lemma is used like entanglement theory or, or for the classical capacity of a quantum channel and so on. So, uh, no, so, uh, so these connections go way back, but they have been in one direction. We, we get these old results and apply them. So maybe now we, you know, we start to, to give something back to the field. So that will be to quantum to statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. So that will be the idea. So now that's it. So I work for Microsoft. I can only use a Mac for 15 minutes at most per day. So I'll have to switch <laughs> the computer. Um, so I'll get this. Microsoft product, it's very good. <laughs> I recommend. <laughs> Let me. Any questions so far? Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, you no, know, one of the topics of this lecture will be Landauer's erasure. So I hope you all do it in the end of the lecture. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, right, so, so I'll try just to, to use that as a, as a whiteboard. Uh, hopefully it will work. If it doesn't work, we can switch to the board. So you just tell me what, what you prefer. So what I want to do in this lecture, so lecture one, uh, I want to discuss uh, 
thermodynamics is a resource. And I will tell you what these resource theories are. So just before that, uh, let's start with some, you know, why why we think or we think not there might be a relation between thermodynamics and information theory, right? So on one side we have thermodynamics, on the other we have info theory. So let's do the table. So what thermodynamics is about, right? So it's, you know, it's this amazing theory in physics, right? We know for hundreds of years, it apply, applies to everything, right? From, from you know, studying black holes to heat engines and so on. Uh, but if you first think about uh, thermodynamics, usually what you think is that, you know, it's a theory to try to understand heat engines, right? Or refrigerators and so on, right? And if you think about information theory, when you know, it was developed by Shannon uh, last century, what you think about is to try to understand how, you know, how well you can send information down some communication channel, right? So it's about communication channels uh, or memories as well, like how well we can record information and so on. So it appears to be, you know, the Two theories appear to describe quite different objects, right? So, uh, and if you think, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, when, when thermodynamics should emerge, right? So, of course, if you go to the microscopic level, usually you think that you have classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics, like, emerges from some cost graining that you're doing. You don't have, like, full control over the system. So, you usually imagine that in thermodynamics, you have just some crude control, right, of the system. And... Whereas in information theory, right, we, we, we are really interested in like, you know, the best way to send information in, in the optimal compression scheme. So you assume that you have full control over, over the system, right? So again, very different, right? So if you look at the concepts, right, in, in thermodynamics, we have like, and we review what they are, some of them, we have like work, we have heat, we have maybe an important one that we see free energy. Uh, whereas in information theory, the you know the concepts are like capacities of channels, right? The you know the best the best rate you can send information, or in gen more in general optimal rates of communication, and so on. So you know why why connection? Right? They seem completely different theories. They apply to different things. They they have uh, uh, you know the the class of operations you consider is different in both cases. Uh, why do you think there is a connection? Well, we, we already saw why, why there might be a connection, right? Because a fundamental concept in both of them is entropy, right? So if you want to get answers in thermodynamics, you have to consider entropy of the system. And this entropy of the system in thermodynamics, right, at least like, you know, I think Clausius was the first one to talk about it a long time ago. I wrote it, ah, yes, 1855. So you know the entropy or the change of entropy, right, relates to, to the to the heat in the system, and temperature is a conversion between these two concepts, right? So, so you know, so temperature in thermodynamics, at least in this formulation, is some disordered form of energy, right? So heat is a disordered form of energy, and you convert to entropy using temperature. So, in information theory, there is also entropy, is fundamental concept, but it's very different, right? So, so the entropy of some source, for example given by a probability distribution PI. I think you all saw this, it's just given by this, right, this channel entropy. And Shannon introduced it in this concept to, you know, to talk about, for example, the optimal compression rate of the source, uh, like 100 years after, pretty much after Clausius, right? So, um, so we have these two concepts of entropy. Uh, and, and the question really, you know, at least now we use the same name. So the question you want to understand is if they are related, right? Um, so, you know, there is a, uh, I don't know if it's true, but it's something that everyone that works in the field says that happened and it's a nice story. Um, so when Shannon, you know, he did his work, um, 
he had like this nice expression that I write here. Uh, and then he went to talk to von Neumann and he said, oh, well, you know, I look at my, the theory that I have, the theory of communication, it's really great, but I don't know how to call the fundamental objects. And then von Neumann said, well, you know, you should definitely talk, uh, call it entropy. First, because, you know, it's the same thing as we do in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics since 100 years ago. But most important because really no one knows what entropy is. So when you, whenever you are in a discussion and you use entropy, you win the discussion. <laughs> and it's true, right? So you see that it's something really, it's, it's quite tricky how to understand. And, and one of the motivations for doing this, all this work that I am going to present part of it, is to try to understand better these concepts in, in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, right? Some, some of these conceptual uh, things are quite tricky to understand, and, and I think using the language of information theory makes them much clearer. Um, okay, so this question, are they related then? Well, for a long time, actually, we know the answer is yes, and this is exactly what statistical mechanics does, right? So they just connect like this Clausius notion of entropy to this channel notion of entropy. And we'll see that. Uh, but now I want to uh, I want to consider a different uh, uh, a different way in which they are related. And this is if you look at entropy as, as a measure of information, right? So actually, you know, entropy is this measure of, of lack of information, right? So we can look at neg entropy, you know, the the absence of entropy, and we can ask whether it's related to information in some sense that you want to specify. And maybe this neg entropy you should think as the thermodynamic neg entropy, right? And information in one sense that we are going to that we are going to define. So the question is whether there is a relation between these two concepts. Um, and we know since some time ago that is also yes. There are several ways that we can make this connection. Uh, and one way that I want to tell you is, which is like, you know, this is pre-quantum information, but it's one of the first times that this connection of entropy and information was made. And then we are going to get more to the, you know, to the new stuff from quantum information. This is, was done, like, this is a thought experiment that you can think, it's called Zillard engine. Uh, so this really shows that, uh, in a sense, uh, having information allows you to draw work in thermodynamics. Okay, so and more precisely, you can make some quantitative connection between having like one bit of work and 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 drawing a certain amount of work that we're going to figure out what it is. So this is like a thought experiment, but nowadays you can people try to do these experiments, uh, some experiments that get really close to the Zillard engine. I will only mention the very uh, you know, unrealistic version of the experiment, but does the job. So you imagine that you have a box, okay, with some movable uh, like wall, this in the middle, and it has like two parts. And imagine that uh, you have a particle, okay, and the particle is, for example, here on the left. Um, then, if you know, knowing that, uh, what if you if this wall is is movable, of course the gas will expand, right? So, so this is just one particle, but let's just imagine that this particle behaves as if like some ideal gas from from thermodynamics. This wall will expand, and expanding it will cre create work, right? And create work in one specific direction, like this direction, right? So you so knowing that the particle is on the left, you know that you can draw work like in the direction uh, like to the right. Now, of course, the same thing would be true if the particle was here. So you know that the, the, you know, the, the movable wall will move to the left now, and you know you can draw some work. Now you can say, well, actually, what if, you know, I don't know where the particle is. It doesn't matter where it is, you get some work. And that's the first thing to, to understand. No, this won't be work, right? Work is ordered energy. So it's like, you know, you, you have to know very well where the energy is stored, in which degrees of freedom it's stored. And if you don't know where the particle is, you know it will, will move somewhere, but you have no control over it. So this is not work, right? This will be like heat. Uh, now we can, you know, we, we can do some very simple calculation, which is not completely true because it's just one atom, and we pretend that we have a lot of atoms for this, 
for these equations to be true, we have to have a lot of atoms, but you give the right intuition. So now let's just use the, you know, the equation of ideal gas. So pressure, volume equals Boltzmann constant temperature. We set Boltzmann constant to one uh, throughout the talk, but now at the moment, let's not do that. So this is a very simple physics problem that we're going to do now. We have X is the position. So what's the pressure? The pressure is force over area. Area A is the area of this, you know, of this wall. Again, you know, a lot of approximation because we just have one atom, but let's do it. The volume, what's the volume? Uh, is right area times X. So if you use these equations, you find right, so force, right? So you just replace P by F over A, V by A times X, A cancels, you get F times X equals KT. You put X on the other side, so you have this equation. Now what's work? Well, let's just use the formula for work that we have, right? Uh, it's just F TX, right? Because, you know, it's moving in, in a, either, you know, if in the first situation, like in this situation, it's moving just to the right. And we can just integrate from L, let's call this L, and initially it's L over two, right? So, you know, just replacing here, we find that we get KT ln two. So this is this, you know, is the Zillard uh, uh, engine formula. So it says that, well, how much information you have here? Well, you know information whether the particle is on the left or on the right. So you have one bit of information. So this one bit of information that you have allows you to draw KT log uh, ln2 of work. So this is like a quantitative relation between, you know, how much information you have and, um, and the amount of work you can draw. So one thing that we see on the last day, but let me just mention, uh, what if now, you know, you, you expanded the, uh, the gas expanded completely. So the wall is here, like, let me draw. The wall is here and the particle can be anywhere here inside. So basically in this situation, the, the best state to describe, describe the particle is just like a uniform mixture over left and right, right? You don't know anything about it. So you have like this state there. And now what you can do, uh, you can see that, you know, this process that we did to, to ex uh, yes, question, no, to, to extract work from, uh, from this information, we can do it in, re in reverse, right? So we can just compress this wall, right? We go from here to here. And then if we do that, we know that the particle is definitely here. And because the process is reversible, you, it's easy to calculate that the amount of work that you have to invest to do that is exactly KT ln2. So this is what is called Landauer's principle. And what it says is that the reverse is always uh, also true, right? So if you wanna, uh, if you wanna uh, reset a bit, right? So for example, the bit here, here was in a completely mixed state. In the end, it's in a specified state, like in a pure state, you see? Then uh, we can do that, but we have to invest amount of work, which is in this case, KT ln2. In the general case, would be proportional to the entropy of the source you wanna, you know, you want to erase. So this is like, you know, this was this first connection that was made between information and thermodynamics, right? So to to uh, to reset information, you have to invest work, and from information you can draw work. Uh, so now, okay. So this was a very specific example, right? So just particle, like one bit of information, you, you get KTL and two. So one question that we want to focus is whether we can generalize it. So, and what I mean by that, well, I mean more specifically, suppose you are given some quantum states, rho, uh, then the question is how much work uh, can we draw from it? Draw from it. Uh, and it's, at the moment, it's a vague question, right? So you have to ask, okay, how, what you can use to extract the work from the particle? And um, but I tell you, so one way to to make this connection is to you know is to is to understand what's what's going on in this protocol, right? In this previous protocol. Um, 
So in this previous pro protocol, what we were using is that we had uh, a lot of information about the state, so we knew it was either on the left for sure or on the right for sure. Well, no, for example, we knew it was on the left for sure, then we could extract work. So really, we're extracting from, uh, this work from, from knowledge of the state in the specified, uh, 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 specified configuration. So if you have a general state in this row, right, so not just, uh, you all know that, but let me just remind you, this row in general will be just some density matrix, right? So what, what we mean by that is just, let's this be the set of density matrix over, over a d dimension of vector, complex vector space. So these are just, you know, they are, they are emission matrix over this vector space. And they are positive same definite, right? All the eigenvalues are bigger than zero. And the trace is one, right? So this is the most general state in, in quantum mechanics in, in finite dimension, at least. And this will be, you know, what we want to understand how to get work out of it. So now suppose, you know, suppose that from row, we apply some operation that we have access to, and we map it to the zero state, m copies of it, where uh, the zero state is just, you know, this comes from a two level system, zero and one, and we have m copies of it. Then, you know, if we could do this transformation, what we can do is just to use this Sealert engine, m times, and out of it, then, you know, from this m copies of zero state, we can draw uh, m, k, t, ln2, uh, I don't know, Joule ja, ja, uh, Jules of work, right? Just using this protocol that I mentioned before. So you see that uh, one way to draw work from quantum states is really to draw purity from it, right? So we start from some state, which in general is mixed, uh, and then for using some, you know, using the, the class of allowed operations that we have to understand what it is. We want to map it to this pure state because from this pure state, we know how to draw work just by the protocol I showed you before. So one way to, to draw work from quantum states is to draw purity out of it, right? And then this is a motivation for understanding uh, uh, like a, a kind of a toy theory that I, I want to describe to you now, which is called a theory of purity in quantum mechanics. And this will be like uh, half of this, uh, of this like uh, quantum information view of thermodynamics. So you see how we combine this theory of purity with uh, like energy conservation, and then we get thermodynamics. We will get there. But now the first question that we want to understand is uh, how much purity uh, can we get? from row. So this will be the first um, question that I wanna, no, that I wanna talk about here. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, that's why I said I was cheating, right? So, uh, but if you wanna, there are several ways to make it more precise. So, uh, of course, the problem is that because you just have one particle, or if you just have a few particles, you have a lot of fluctuations, and these fluctuations will be important, and I, I didn't address them, right? But what you can think is that suppose you, you know, you can have, um, so one way to, to make it a little bit more precise is that suppose that you have not, not one box, but you have a lot of these boxes, okay? And you have like one particle in each one of them, so now you can just think that you know this this wall, this movable wall, is the same for all of them, and then you start getting closer to the situation where you have a lot of you know a, a lot of atoms, and then you know you, you can start you can start using the ideal gas equation, and then you see that the same thing w will happen, but in the end you just get instead of kT ln two you get the number of particles times kT ln two as an answer if you just use the same procedure that I followed before, and that's a, maybe a more rigorous way of doing that. But, but this is not meant to, to be a rigorous derivation, it's just meant to be like, you know, something to have in mind why we get this KT ln2. So this KT ln2 is much more fundamental, you can, you can think about many other uh, you know, uh, thought experiments and you get the same answer. This is just like the simplest way to derive it, but it's not rigorous, I, I completely agree. But you can make it rigorous and 
you can even like think careful about fluctuations and so on when you have a few particles. It gets harder, but there is there's some works that do that. That's a good question. So let me erase this. Okay. So that's the question: How much purity we can get from a state row, from row? Uh, so as we see, so you know, we um, this is example. So let me just tell you something more general now again before we get to the specifics of this problem. And this is what you know what I mean by this resource theories that I said. You no know, thermodynamics example, and we are trying to develop like this resource theory view of thermodynamics. So this is like just some some classification of, of theories or you know of, uh, very specific theories, but uh, still interesting. Um, and uh, and this is like trying to to describe a, a physical theory, and I'll give some examples uh, from from few basic properties that they have in common. Uh, and one is to first say, okay, that, that a physical theory comes from uh, specifying the class of physical operations that we have access to. So class of, I have to write small abbreviation. Um, so this is one thing that we, you know, want to spe specify when we have a physical theory, right? So we will see examples, I will just write examples after. So this one would be one important aspect of these theories. Another one would be, you know, we have like this class of operations that the, opera the physical operations we have access to. And this class will allow us to create some physical states uh, with no cost. So there will be some class of free states. So states that we can create for free without investing any, any resource. So because we have uh, this class of operations, which are restricted class of operations, right? They don't include all physical operations. Uh, there will be certain things that we cannot do, right? There will be some restrictions. And usually what will happen is that uh, resource will emerge. And you can think of this resource as, uh, as, no, as a physical resource that allows, you to, uh, uh, that allows you to go beyond this restriction on the class of operations. Okay, so, so you have some resource that if you have access to it, you can implement more operations than just this class of operations that you were restricted to originally. And again, it will be clear once I give you some examples. Then this will be uh, you know, the, the, the core of the theory. And then there are certain things that we want to understand about this theory. And one thing would be like, uh, important thing in this lecture would be the rate of conversion between states. So we have like two, st two states and we like to understand when using the class of allowed operations we can convert one into the other and at which rates, right? How many, for example, copies of one we need to get one copy of the other and so on. Um, okay, I'll tell more about this later. So what, what are the examples? So one example that I think many of you know, uh, or at least heard of, of course, is entanglement. My G is very ugly. Entanglement theory. So entanglement theory, right? For maybe you know, it was the, like the first resource theory that we study in, in quantum information, and and I think it's a very successful example, right? We learn about a lot about it. Uh, so how to make sense of entanglement theory? Well, entanglement theory, we think that you know we have we have two parties or more, Alice and Bob, and we pretend that. Uh, they are very far away, and to send quantum communication is difficult, so they cannot send quantum communication. But they have a telephone line, so they can just talk to each other, so they can send classical information, and they can coordinate. So what's the class of operations? We call this LOCC. So this stands for local operations. So these are any uh, operation. Alice can do any operation allowed by quantum mechanics locally on his lab. On her lab, Bob can do any operation allowed by quantum mechanics local on 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 hers, and then they can, uh, you know, they, for example, Alice makes a measurement, communicates to Bob, like sends the classical outcome to Bob. This is a classical measure. This is fine. Then Bob makes a measurement, sends back and back and forth. So local operations and uh, plus classical communication. So this is the class of operations. And now, uh, no, suppose we start from, from nothing. We start like the two labs, they are 
in, in uh, uncorrelated states, for example, vacuum in both of them. Uh, and then we, we want to ask, okay, if we have access to this class of operations, which states we can create, right? And then if you think, and uh, you know, this is not on anything I'm theory, so I won't talk much about it, uh, but we know that the class of free states are, are what we call the separable states, which are just states which are not entangled, okay? So they only contain classical correlations. And what's the resource? Well, of course, the resource is entanglement, right? So if you have entanglement, we can go from LCC to any operation allowed by quantum, by quantum theory, which is the teleportation, for example. So entanglement is a resource that allows us to, uh, to lift the class of operations from LCC to general quantum operations. And, and rate of conversion, uh, we will see, that, no, that, that this will be more technical, but we'll just see that actually the, the, same, the same kind of quantity appears in, in many resource theories. The answer that we get here is using depending on the setup, either entropies or uh, majorization uh, or uh, Rennie entropies. So, the, um, so they will be important, you know, this like entropies and majorization and, and Rennie entropies, they will be, they will be like the, the right formulas for describing how we can do this state transformation here. So an example that we, we will see in the SQL. Huh. That I already mentioned is the theory of purity. So we need this class of operations and we're going to introduce this next. This is what we call these noisy operations. So basically these are the operations that we can implement when we have no access to purity. Okay, so suppose uh, we can do quantum mechanics, but we have no access to pure states. Then what we do, uh, this will be these noisy operations. And we see that the free states in these noisy operations are just uh, states which are maxly mixed. Okay, so maxly mixed state, they are free. Uh, what's the resource? The resource will be purity, right? So like any state in a pure state, any quantum system in a pure state will be a resource. You can do something valuable with it. Uh, and the important, why am I making this table? Well, because the answers will be very similar. So, so what, what, what all I, that I wrote here, you know, it will be like direct counterparts here. So the answers will be in terms of the same quantities. Um, one other theory before I go the last one, which should be, of course, thermodynamics, that I won't discuss, but maybe some of you know, uh, and it's relevant for thermodynamics, is, is this theory of reference frames. So here the idea is that, you know, you have some observable, but it, this observable or this experimentalist is restricted to a super selection rule. For example, it can be charge, right? So charge is conserved. And of course, if charge is conserved, he cannot implement any operations, he cannot implement operations which are like block diagonal in, in the sectors of the charge, right? So, uh, so you know, so uh, he can only implement operations uh, that preserve the super selection rule. Super selection. And one example is charges, it would be like U1, right? But you can have other groups, you can have like SU2, doesn't matter. Um, so what's the class of free states now? Free states are just, again, same thing, states that, you know, uh, preserve super selection rule. And what's a resource? Well, a resource is something that allows you to, to lift this super selection rule. It's just a reference frame, right? So, you know, some super selection rules are fundamental laws of nature, like charge conservation, there is nothing you can do about it, but some others like particle conservation can lift, right? So like for particle conservation, a reference frame would be like a superconductor or a superfluid. Um, or, you know, if you have like SU2 symmetry, a reference frame can be like the two labs which are not aligned, a reference frame can be just like a very, a very big, like classical spin aligned in the same direction, right? So that's the idea. And, and this, I won't specify how these theories work. There is very nice work on them. For example, there is some, long, some review by uh, Speckens and Boer. You can check there if you want. But if you see, the answers will be very similar. It will be the of quantities, like majorization and 
and, and for Neumann entropies and so on, depending on the, on the setting. And the last one, which is more the focus here, of course, is thermodynamics. Uh, and we see, so what's the class of operations? The class of operations would be what we call thermal operations. And this, we will get to that in the end of the, of the lecture, right? So this should correspond to what we expect uh, is the class of accessible information uh, operations in thermodynamics, right? So and in particular, it would be like, you know, what we expect from isothermal processes. So isothermal process processes, we have a system, we have a bath, they are in, in equilibrium, so a temperature is fixed. And then, of course, they can exchange particles, the system and the bath, and then you have access to some kind of operations. And this thermal operation would be a, a way to abstract what we expect from these isothermal operations on the quantum level. So we will discuss what they are soon. So what are free states in thermodynamics? This will be Gibbs states, which are just thermal states, right? So states, uh, you know, have this diagonal in an energy eigenbasis, and the eigenvalues are just these Boltzmann weights. What's the resource? Will be work, right? Uh, work will allow us to change one state from the other, or we allow to implement any operation that we want physically, right? Just other energy. Using that, we can do anything. And the rate of conversion, again, will be the same quantities. Okay, so we will see that there is a lot of parallels between these theories. And I, I, I find this very, very remarkable because they are, right, they are, you know, some of them are very different one from the other. But it's still, uh, it's still in a sense, they have the same structure, right? So let me see if I am on time. Okay. Um, yes, okay, so. I think what, uh, any question? Okay. Uh, so, uh, how many of you know anything, uh, yes? Are you uh, sure? So, um, so for example, for this theory of purity, we have some nice example. So, a theory of purity, uh, we have these noisy operations, and this is basically I will tell you later, but let me tell you right now. So, the, the operations will be: you can do any unitary you want, you can add maximally mixed states as many as you want, and you can trace out subsystems. Okay, and then this will be some class of operations, and this gives like. You know, the maximum mixed state is the free state, and purity is the resource. But you can also have another class of operations, which are simply any operation that maps maximum mixed state to maximum mixed state. This is a called like, uh, here is basically class for the theory. So these are like these bi stochastic channels. And they are different from these noise operations. But it's you, you know, all the answers will be the same. No, because the so noise operations are contained in these bi stochastic channels, right? So one is a larger class. Just with this smaller class, it's more physical. You already get the same answers as if you use this larger class, which is like le less physical. It's, it's hard to justify why you have access to it. But yeah, and you have many more examples like in, in this, uh, this kind of. So how many of you uh, know a little bit of entanglement theory for like pure states, for bipartite pure states? Raise your hand, maybe. Okay, so many of you don't, right? Okay. Um, and this is not a course on entanglement theory, so I won't have time to, to explain it to you. But because so many of the concepts that we see in entanglement theory uh, will appear later on, what I want to do now is just like for 15 minutes do a very short uh, review on, on this theory of entanglement for bipartite pure states. And you know, if you never saw this, I'm, it's a bit hard to get everything. But this will be more just to introduce the, the quantities that will appear later. Okay, so. Um, so let me know if you know if if you're not understanding it. So this is supposed to be a review. It's not a topic of this lecture, but will be useful. What happens for entanglement theory, right? And and this is like a ve very broad topic that is is very interesting and can get very hard. Even like for mixed states, it gets very complicated. We we don't have many answers actually, even after like 15 years, 20 years. But one case we understand very well. And which luckily is what we 
we are, you know, what will be relevant for us here is for bipartite pure states. Right, so what's the idea is that we have like, you know, usually we call them Ellis and Bob, so experimentalists, they share some quantum system, there's some cuts, and as I said, what they can do is LOCC, local operations and classical communication, so they can send inform classical information back and forth and they can do whatever quantum mechanics allows locally. And now we assume here is this, the restriction, is already bipartite, Ellis and Bob, but they share a pure state. We assume that they share a pure state, and what we, they would like to do is to transform this pure state to another pure state, okay, that's their goal. And because they have a restriction on the operations they can do, they cannot do that in general, right? So uh, we don't understand uh, what are the rules under which conditions they can make this transformation. So what's a pure state? Uh, any pure state we can write in this way there will be like square root of a probability distribution PI, these are the Schmidt uh, values, or eigenvalues, and then there will be some local basis, uh, IA and IB, these are the Schmidt eigenvectors, right, so these are orthogonal bases, and we have this probability distribution PI here, okay, so these local bases, you can rotate them locally, you can apply local unitaries to A and local unitaries to B, LOCC includes these local unitaries, so this local basis has no effect in the resource theory, right? The only thing that matters in the resource theory is this probability distribution, okay? So, so the only invariant property, the one that, you know, will tell how much of a resource the state is, is this probability distribution. And then there are several problems that we study here, and this will be like similar problems that we study in thermodynamics later on, so I'll introduce them and just tell you what the solution is without explaining. One is the setting that is very important because it's where we get the, the cleanest answer, okay? So we get like very simple answers is when we, we call these asymptotic transformations. So what are they? Well, let's denote it by, we have a, a state, uh, psi, and we want to convert by the class of operations LOCC in this asymptotic uh, framework into phi, a, b. And what I, this will be the notation. What we mean by that? We mean that, you know, that's the case if in the limit where we have many copies of the one state, we can get many copies of the other one with some error that vanishes asymptotically. So how we can write the equation on that? So it's like a limit, right? So this will be a complicated equation, but it's simple to understand. So I'll, I'll spell in words, but it's good to, to see the, to see it written down. So we just take the minimum or the infimum because the, you know, eventually the dimension grows much. So of, uh, of some quantum operation, what's a quantum operation is just write some quantum channel, some C completely positive trace preserving map. That belongs to this class of LOCC. So think about, you know, like local operations on Alice, communication, local operations on Bob, back and forth as many times as they want. So we look at the best operation, LOCC operation. We apply it to many copies of psi. Uh, it over here. And we wanna get copies of phi. Like n copies, but we don't care if you, you know, this is like, like two leading orders, so we can have like some small o of n here. This just means some quantity that goes, uh, that's sublinear in n. Okay, so we get like almost n copies to first order n copies, but there is some error, and the error we usually quantify like trace distance is a good way, and we want to this error is equal to zero asymptotically, okay? So it didn't fit on the slide, it have to move back and forth. So you know, so we consider limit of large number of copies, this is this limit. For each number of copies, we look at the best operation to make the transformation, this is this infimum. The transformation doesn't have to be exact, so you know, there will be a small error between the output of this channel and the target state. We also don't require that we get n copies, but we get like, you know, almost n copies. And in the limit, this error goes to zero. Okay, so that's the, that's the important thing. So it's a combination of, so, so why this setting is nice? Because it's a combination of asymptotics that allows us to simplify things a lot usually, and some small probabilities of error. That is also crucial if you wanna get nice answers. So, you, you know, 
it's not completely completely true, but in a sense, it's like like taking the thermodynamic limits in this situation, right? So we're taking thermodynamics. We know is, it has these very simple formulas, but it has these very simple formulas because we we look at these huge systems and we do some cost graining over it, right? So we allow like some only a few operations, and they can and they don't have to be perfect and so on. So here is doing something similar, but in a you know in a in a different way, but it's something similar in spirits and. And that's why we get entropy here as we get entropy in thermodynamics, right? Because we are combining like this thermodynamic limit, this limit of many copies or of large systems with allowing some kind of error. And this, this will become clear later, but it's a, I think it's a nice uh, insight that we learned from, from studying these problems from the point of view of quantum information. Okay, so, so that's what we mean by this transformation. Maybe you, you never saw it, it's good to see what's trace norm. Uh, so we define for some matrix. Actually, let's suppose a emission matrix X for, uh, th there are many definitions, but let me give you the operational one. What we do, we maximize over M, which is, you know, the eigenvalues are smaller than one and bigger than minus one. And we compute trace MX, okay? So suppose that X, for example, is a difference of two quantum states, as is usually the case for us. Then you can simplify this to like twice maximum over M between identity and, and zero. So it's M is positive, same definite. The eigenvalues are smaller than one. Trace M rho minus sigma, absolute value. And what, what, what this means, well, this is really the optimal probability of distinguishing rho from sigma, right? So this M is just a P of M element, right? So what we're doing, we're, we're doing the best dichotomic P of M that try to distinguish rho from sigma. And this trace norm is just, you know, is the bias from half that we can distinguish the two. So the trace norm can be at most two. Uh, if it's two, we can perfectly distinguish the two states. If it's zero, we cannot distinguish the two states at all, right? Any measurement, we, we get the same uh, expectation value on both. And, and in general, it tells you how far the two states are from each other. If you do any experiment that you want on them. So that's, that's the interpretation of this quantity. Yes. Uh, so, uh, no. They it's, sh yeah, it can shrink, yes. Because it can, uh, it can make a measurement locally, for example, right? You can make a measurement and then the result of the measurement is we live in some smaller, or you can just like apply some unitary that decouples part of it and throw away, right? So. Oh yeah, but uh, ah, I see. Um, you have a good point. So here in firm dynamics and the result, sorry, in, in entanglement theory, the result you see, it's independent of the local dimensions of the states. But in firm dynamics, it's very important that we, that we keep track of them. In this theory of purity, for example, this would be an important point. So we have to remember what's the local dimensions. But in entanglement theory, they are not relevant because, for example, you can make a measurement or you can apply isometry and increase the local dimension, right? But, but it's a good point to keep in mind that in some resource theories, we have to specify very well what, what are the local spaces, right? Or what are the spaces? Okay, so, so this is the setting. So now, can we understand when we can make this conversion, right? And, and that's the one of the, like, you know, most fundamental results in, in, in quantum information. This is by Bennett, uh, what well, the odds, Bernstein, Popescu, Schumacher from 95. What they found is that, let's use our notation, right, that we just developed. We can make this transformation by LCC asymptotically. Uh, if and only if, I'll write this like that, right? It means like if and only if is a, is a complete, is a necess necessary and sufficient condition. Um, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state on A is bigger than the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state uh, on A of phi, okay? Um, so what's the reduced state? So if phi AB was, was this guy, right, we wrote before, 
the reduced states. Okay, I, I'm using this notation. This is like a mixed state now. Maybe it's a bit confusing, but uh, I'll use just this time, so it's okay. So this means the, the reduced state when we trace out the B subsystem. So what's the equation for it? It's, it's simple, right? It's just PI and this local basis. Okay. So this is a mixed state. And we can compute the von Neumann entropy, right? So what's what's the von Neumann entropy of a, of a density matrix? We just take the minus trace rho log rho, right? And you know, uh, rho and log rho, uh, they have the same basis. So this is just a function of the eigenvalues of rho, really. So in terms of the eigenvalues of rho, it's just the Shannon entropy, right? So we all know that. So it's just uh, if pi are the eigenvalues of rho i, that's the expression, okay? So it's really nice, right? So you have uh, we have one number that tells you everything, right? And we see later on that in the other resource theories that we're going to look at, the same will be true. And actually some function very similar to this one. So the entropy is all that matters if you have like, you know, in this limit of many copies and small error. Um, so this, uh, this is very special about resource theories. Um, so what it implies in particular, it implies, implies what we call uh, reversibility. The theory is reversible. So uh, what it means, well, suppose that we have some number of copies, uh, like n copies of, we have these states, right? Then we know that by this asymptotic LOCC transformations, we can map it uh, to m copies of phi as long as uh, you know the two the two has to have the same entropy, right? So as long as m uh, times entropy of phi a equals n times entropy of psi a, right? So we match the entropy, so you can make the transformation. Um, but now we can also make the, the reverse transformation, right? Because again, the entropies are the same, right? So we can apply the the theory, the, the result again. And we just recover n copies of psi a b, right? So you see that you know doesn't matter which state you have, you can always convert one state into the other as long as uh, as you change the number of copies that you have for each one of them, right? So you can like freely interconvert two two states as long as like uh, the number of copies m that you get from one divided by the number of copies of the original one equals to the ratio of the entropies, the reduced entropies. Right, so this reduced entropy is really a measure of resource. It's telling you how much entangled the state is, right? In the sense that if it's very big, uh, you need a lot of copies of some other states to, to get to it, right? And it, if it's very big again, you can create a lot of copies of some other states starting from it, right? So then it's very simple. It's just, you know, it's just this entropy. And we see that in film dynamics, we have something very similar later on. Uh, yes. Bigger than if the initial, if the ent local entropy of the initial state is bigger than of the final state. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so uh, well, I, I don't want to explain that protocol. So that's a problem. I can explain to you uh, in the, in the break, but just to get some intuition. So one example is the suppose we are on two qubit systems now. Very simple two qubit systems. And we, we have this that we call maximum entangled state. And this will be this state, okay, which is just, right, it's maximum max entangled state. And what we know is that because of teleportation, do you know teleportation? Because of teleportation, starting from this state, you can create by local operations, like uh, any other states of two qubits, right? Uh, so you see that this state is like maximum resource in a sense, right? From it, you can create any other state. And now if you look at the, entrop the local entropy of this guy, you see that it's maximum, right? So locally this state, right? Uh, the A part of this state is just the uniform superposition. So this, you know, just to give intuition that why uh, bigger entropy should be better, right? So this guy has maximum local entropy and is the best state. We can create any other state from it. 
in general, I have to explain the protocol, and I, I will do that like for film dynamics, and the ideas will be similar, but I want to skip it now. I can, I can tell you later. Um, okay. So, so great. So, so the, the, the message here is that if you have asymptotic transformations, the right, uh, the right rate uh, will be in terms of some phonema entropy, right? So, and we see that emerge again and again. But you know, sometimes we are not interested in like in many copies. We just have one copy. We have one physical system, and we have to deal with it, right? We have to just have one copy, one realization of the system. What can we do? This is the single copy uh, transformations. And uh, what we will denote is just something similar. Just with LCC without this asymptotic, right? So, and what this notation means? Well, it just means that there exists some quantum channel, some operation which is LCC, uh, such that lambda applied to the density matrix associated to psi gives you exactly the density matrix associated to AB. Okay. So that's right. Maybe that should be the first definition because that's the, the most natural, right? It's very it's a very simple definition. The trouble is that uh, because you know it's, it's a more demanding task, right? Uh, the, the answers won't be as nice as asymptotically. So we can we can again characterize when we can uh, make these transformations, but it will be a, a harder criterion. It will be a more complicated one. But this was found, uh, and it's. It's some results by Nielsen, 98. It's a very, it's a very beautiful theorem. It's very, it's actually simple to prove, pretty much. I won't give you the proof, but it's, it's not complicated and it's, it's very um, elegant. So it says that psi, a b, you can transform by LCC into phi a b. If and only if. Again, you look at the reduced density matrix of A and, and, and B. Or actually, um, mm, let me do different. So, so this will be the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix for Psi. This will be the eigenvalues for the reduced density matrix of Phi. And this will be the case if and only if uh, P as a probability vector. Uh, I never know the if it majorized or is majorized by, but maybe Daniel knows. You know, I, the nomenclature always confuses me, so I just, if you don't know, I just make it up and we we'll just use the, <laughs> but if you know it. Uh, no, but I know, but uh, what do you call it? You say that P majorizes Q or P is majorized by Q. We can just say, you know, P will majorize, that's our convention, P will majorize Q. And you know, maybe you don't know what it is, I'll explain what is operation. So this is a more refined way of telling that one distribution is more mixed than the other. Entropy is one way, this is a more refined way. Like if P majorizes Q, then it means that the entropy of P is bigger than the entropy of Q, but it gives more constraints. Um, so wh what's the definition of this majorization? And again, in thermodynamics, we will see that the same concept will be useful again. Uh, so what is majorization? We say that x majorizes y. They are, they are like two probability vectors. Let's restrict to probability vectors. If um, we sum i from 1 to l, the component xi, uh, we will order the vector. Let me tell you later. So this equation has to be true. Where we order the vector, okay? So x1 is bigger than x2 is bigger, blah, 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 or equal. xk, they have k components, both of them, and the same for y. Um, okay, so, um, so for example, uh, if you have, you know, if y is a maximally mixed distribution, and you, you know, it's majorized by any other distribution, right? Because it's the minimum value possible for each component, right? So of course, the largest component of of any probability distribution of k components has to be bigger than one over k. So the first equation will be true when when l is one, 
and, and the other ones as well. You can see that. So it's some good exercise to see. So maybe I'll write as an exercise. Uh, show uh, that this is true, or actually that for, for all p, p majorizes the maximum mix distribution. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, I reversed it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, no, but I, it's not correct from the theorem. No, uh, because no, because p uh, max. Yeah. Uh, yes. But then p. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Fine. Good. Uh, all right. So now, you know, so th that, that gives the answer again. It's more complicated than entropy, but it's still pretty simple, right? So, of course, we, we lose reversibility here now. So it's not the case that we can convert one state to another and come back without losing anything. There is some irreversibility here in the transformations, but it's the way it is, at least like a simple rule again. And that's, that's nice. Now, um, yes. Well, I think usually in the end you you never have many copies, right? You have a finite number of copies, right? <laughs> well, suppose you just someone gives you one copy, right? So you know, it, usually when you have one experiment, where you have one copy of it there, right? You don't have many co you don't have many realizations of the same experiment, right? That's a yeah, but it can be, for example, imagine that which is usually the case that the source is correlated, right? So in the end, you have like a big source which is correlated, then you can treat it as one. But of course, you know it has some structure. But right, so of course, uh, this uh, this ID is a very good abstraction. But in the end, it's never what really is the case, right? But any you know, it's just um, if you don't like single copy, you can always think that you have this result just to consider a large but finite number of copies and understand what will be the result, right? And this will be different from from entropies, right? So because there you have to have some error and take the limits in some way, so. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, but it, yeah, for entanglement, doesn't matter so much. So because uh, we, we want to uh, finally apply the same things to thermodynamics, and there, you know, many times you have just one, one copy of the experiment, right? Which is small, and it, and this will play a role there. Right? So that that will be the idea. Another concept that uh, actually. Oh yeah, definitely. No, thank you. Yeah, of course. This this is for all L, you know, from one to K, belonging to one to one to K. Thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, some some interesting phenomena uh, uh, related to majorization and to single copy transformations that will be important in thermodynamics and was found in entanglement theory by by Daniel actually Daniel Jonathan, one of the organizers and and Martin Plenio is catalysis. So let me introduce what it is. Ninety-nine. So what they found is that there exists some x and y such that x does majorize y, but uh, if you add some other probability vector, okay, take the tensor product to create a new probability distribution that majorizes y tensor z, okay? So uh, whenever this is the case, this defines a new uh, order between probability distributions, and this has been called trumping. Um, what's one example? I will let for you to check, so maybe see as an exercise, if you wanna practice it. Consider where x is four, 10, four over 10, 1 over 10, 1 over 10. Maybe this is from Daniel's paper, I'm not sure, it might be. Uh, y is half 1, 4, 1, 4, 0. And this z is 6 over 10, 4 over 10. 
So you can check that x doesn't majorize y, but z tensor z majorizes y tensor z. Okay, so some calculation you if you want you can try it. Uh, and so because we have this phenomenon for of catalysis in why, why, why we call this catalysis? Well, because we can look at what this implies for single copy transformations, right? And then we have like this catalytic, uh, catalytic single copy transformations. Uh, again, let's introduce some notation. So we say that's the case. If there exists another state, eta, on A and B, but some, you know, some other subsystem A, other subsystem B, such that you can transform this by LCC into pi a b at the a prime b prime. Okay, so w why does that's interesting? Because sometimes, right, as this example shows, if you construct quantum states out of them, this x z and and y, maybe psi cannot be converted into phi by LCC. But if you add these other states uh, eta, then you can make the transformation. But you didn't use eta at all, right? Eta is still there. So eta x as a catalyst here, right? It allows you to make the transformation but you don't disturb it. You need it, but you can give it back, right? So you just borrow it, and then you do the transformation, you give it back. So, um, yeah, this is everything I'm saying for bipartites. Well, it's bipartite between uh, Alice and Bob, but uh, the, the A prime Hubert space can be different from the A one. It can be larger, Some, and, and in general it has to be. Uh, so, so now we want to understand, okay, we, we had this nice, uh, so uh, Shannon uh, von Neumann entropy tells you what happens asymptotically. Majorization tells you what happens single copy uh, when you don't have catalysis. What's the criterion for when you have a catalyst, right? So that's, uh, that was open for a long time, right? So this was discovered in, in, in 99 that there exists this, this catalyst. Then it was an open problem to get some nice criterion for it, right? And, and the answer just came some some time later, and it's very nice results. So you know uh, everything that I told you, I, I didn't give. I'm just stating the results without explaining why they are true, and they are all very simple. This one is more complicated, actually. Um, this is this. It was like independent discovered by Turgut and Klimesh. I, I think actually, over 2007. Uh, and what they proved is that psi a b uh, LCC catalytic transformations into phi a b if and only if now uh, something similar to for normal entropy if some entropies are monotonic of the reduced density matrix um, we know which are just like channel ent entropies or uh, particular uh, uh, classical entropies of the probability distribution of the marginals of the eigenvalues. If this is true, but now instead of one entropy, we have a family of entropies. This has to be true for all h alpha for alpha bigger the or equal to zero. Okay, so I have to tell you what, what are these functions, right? So these functions are what we call uh, Rennie entropies. They will be important in thermodynamics also. Um, and what's the definition? It's just Rennie entropy of some density matrix rho. It's just, you take the sine of alpha, one minus alpha, and then you, you look at, um, at log, trace rho to the power of alpha, okay? So again, we can write in terms of 
uh, the eigenvalues of rho if you want, right? So. This would be, uh, if these are the eigenvalues, this would be the expression, okay? So how it relates to fundamental entropy? Yes. All alpha in reals, yes. The majorization, yes, the good question. So, uh, I mean, first this, is Right, so let's answer that is a good question. So, so first question, is this more uh, restrictive than just checking the Shannon entropy or the von Neumann entropy? And the answer is yes, because the von Neumann entropy, I will call it S, right? So S and, and H, are maybe I'll change between them. So the, the von Neumann entropy of, of rho, I will also write this many times, uh, H of rho. This is ac actually equals to the limit when alpha goes to one on the right, for example, of, uh, this is just some technicality of H alpha, okay? So the, the condition for asymptotic transformation is one of the conditions there, but there are many more, there are infin infinitely many more, okay? They're all there. The other question is whether, you know, this should be less restrictive than majorization, right? Because, uh, you know, when you can do the transformation without catalysis, of course, we can do with catalysis, with trivial catalysis. And you can see that's the case because uh, all these entropies, uh, these uh, Rennie entropies, they are they are monotonic if one state, if one probability distribution majorizes the other. If one probability distribution majorizes the other, then any f like sure uh, sure convex function is monotonic, and these are examples of sure convex functions. So that's just some sanity check. Um, okay. Good. So this was much more I want to say about entanglement theory, but you know you see that all these quantities they will appear again. So I think that's that's useful. Any question on this? Okay, great. Right. So now let's go to the main topic of well, a little bit more closer to the main topic of of the course, which is this resource we see. theory of purity, okay? And this is, was done by Horodecki, Michal Horodecki, uh, Richard Horodecki, and Jonathan Oppenheim in 2003. Um, so they, they work it out. So as I said, what you know is a resource theory, right? Entanglement was LOCC. What's the class of operations here? And this will be uh, what we call this noisy operations. And they consist uh, of the following, you know, they're, they're concatenation of the following operations. You can add uh, maximally mixed states. Um, so you can add as many maximally mixed states as you want. Maximally mixed is a free resource, right? So these are free resources. Um, you know, you, you want to preserve purity, right? Purity should be a resource, so you have to you, you can apply operations as long as it preserves purity. And what they are, they are unitaries, right? So you can apply any unitary you want. Oops. Uh, unitaries. And of course, you can also always discard subsystems, right? You can always throw away subsystems, so you can trace out. Um, so something that Fernando asked, right? So uh, here it's very important to keep track what what the dimension of the Hilbert space is, right? Because purity is a resource, so you cannot increase the dimension of the Hilbert space just adding a pure state, right? So if you have a dimension, you're fixed to the dimension. So let's think that uh, we have like some underlying Hilbert space, CD, for example, and we can have many copies of it. So we can have CD to the power of n, but we're fixed to this dimension D. Okay, we cannot change this D. Changing the zero will 
would cost you because you would have to add some unsealed and some pure state. Um, so now we want to basically uh, right. So what's one motivation for studying this? One motivation is to try to connect to go back to this problem right of understanding how much work we can draw from a quantum state. Uh, but now to to make sense of it, we we have to ask why this uh, you know why this class of operations is reasonable for for this respect. Uh, and, uh, and it's not completely reasonable, but uh, this is like a, a first step. This is basically a theory where entropy or neg, neg entropy is the only resource, right? So because we can implement any unitary, the only thing that matters here is, is mixing, right? This entropy. So so this you should see this as some as some toy model uh, for for thermodynamics that later we are going to fix to to make it more realistic by adding energy conservation as well. Okay, so this is like what we expect from thermodynamics, but when we don't have energy conservation. You only have entropy. Entropy is the only resource. So we can also call it like uh, thermal for heat, if you want. Uh, but we see that you know it, it will help us, us a lot when we go to the, other, to the more complicated one. Uh, so what are the questions we want to ask here? Yes, we have. Uh, OK, I don't have time anymore, actually. So. Right, so we will, you know, we will continue in the next lecture. What we will do, we will try to answer the same question we answer for entanglement theory here. Okay, so we look at asymptotic state transformations. We get again a single quantity, something related to the entropy. We consider single copy transformations. Majorization will be the same. We consider catalysis, uh, trumping, and uh, and Rennie entropies will be the same. So we have a, a very similar structure, even though you know. A, uh, uh, operationally, they are very different, right? And then finally, I want to do this lecture, but I didn't have time. We will go to thermodynamics, okay, where we put this, you know, this thermal for kids together with energy conservation, and then we get uh, like, you know, something closer to what we see in thermodynamics. We get like free energy, free energy, for example, as the as the right monotone for transformations. But we will see this next lecture. So, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so thank you. That's all for today.